and regards to disability experience and disability culture. We can only do so much in one evening, and really this is just a taster session to open up the conversation. Museums are perfect spaces to model best practices for society in a public setting, and increasingly they are places for creating social change. But how are we doing in the realm of disability culture? How do our own institutions relate to and include people with disabilities? At Cultural Connections, we wanted to move the conversation on by handing the power over to the disability community to lead us in an evening of inquiry. What is possible when we think beyond the limits of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, beyond the limiting notion of minimum compliance, beyond tick boxes and spreadsheets? We wanted to provoke a conversation about what it would mean to really be inclusive. And to that end, we have a wonderful array of speakers for you, all experts in their field, so that your understanding of disability will shift. Our speakers understand the complexities of design for disability. They've helped create effective exhibitions and programs that privilege people with disabilities and have each expanded the field. They know about the misery of design failures and the joys of exceeding expectations. <laughs> for some of you, their work will be a revelation, while for others it may be old news. Wherever you are is totally fine because we are all still learning. But I promise that you will never think about disability in the same way going forward. And hopefully we can create a shift in what happens here in the Bay Area. And now I'm delighted to hand over to our moderator, Anthony Tesla, who is a writer, photographer, consultant, train, trainer, and disability issues advocate. Anthony, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Well, I find this an interesting conundrum that we're in. You're, here we have a cultural co connections group who tends to think of the world, and I think that the museum and people in general tend to think of the world from a cultural perspective and moving, bringing a vision for improving the world, improving the lives of the people who come to the ex exhibitions. And at the same time, we're talking about disability. Fran talked about the tech the tick boxes for disability and that yes, do we have is the print large enough or the doorways wide enough, you know, are the bathrooms accessible. But disability we have a tendency to think about those tick boxes more than anything else is what I've seen. And it oftentimes that's what takes our attention. And so what excited me about this evening is to talk a little bit about what might disability culture, the idea of disability culture, bring to what we're talking about tonight. And actually, I did so reluctantly. We were on a planning uh, conference call, and we were talking about, let me tell you that I am going to go through the agenda so you know what we're, we're going to be doing. We're going to break up into small groups, and what are we going to talk about in the small groups? And I was saying, okay, well, you know, what's one of the big problems in museums? I know. There's no place to sit. If there is a place to sit, they don't have arms. So older people can't sit down and can't get back up. Why aren't there more benches in museums? I thought this was a perfectly legitimate thing to talk about. But the people on the conference call, and they dealt with that enough. And so we went round and round. And finally I said, well, I'll tell you what really Benches don't really excite me. What does excite me is the idea of disability culture and how is my culture as a disabled person reflected in my museum experience. Because it happens so rarely, but when it does happen, it's so lovely and so wonderful and so affirming. I know that in general, my ideas about what society is about have been changed in profound ways by museum exhibits. By a good exhibit with good information, I'm thinking in particular of the Anthropology Museum in uh, Victoria, where it made my whole view of indigenous people's lives change by that exhibit. I've had a little, a few of those as a disabled person. 
the most profound, I think, and I wouldn't expect any of you to be able to pull this off. I think uh, Catherine Nod at the Smithsonian, probably the only one who could have, but in the American History Museum at the Smithsonian, there was an exhibit of disability history that was 20 feet away from the lunch counter from the Woolworths where those sit-ins happened by the African-American students. My civil rights and the African-American civil rights movement, they're in the same setting and a, a wonderful exhibit of artifacts of my community. Everything from a wheelchair by the first wheelchair that was designed by a wheelchair user and became commercially successful to numbered gravestones where people didn't even have names at a mental institution, which brought tears to my eyes. That was a profound and wonderful experience. And that's a touchstone for me for kind of the cultural experiences would be wonderful to be able to create for disabled people to help me understand who I am as a disabled person and my setting. Thank you. Oh, good. I just got the five minute mark and I realized I don't have a clock and I'm going to be in trouble. But I, I like 50 minute lectures personally. <laughs> it's all right, Fran, I won't. I think a better example is when I went, I made sure that I went to the FDR Memorial. It was about a year after it had been uh, installed on the Potomac. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, four-term president of the United States, person with polio. His polio was ignored for decades until finally some books came out about him. And when they planned his memorial, there is no depiction of him as a disabled person. It took my community, arguing with the family and others, for a statue of him in a wheelchair to be installed at that exhibit. And it was wonderful to go to that FDR memorial and see that statue of him in his wheelchair. That was incredibly affirming. There are hidden stories of disability that you need to have people who are connected to the disability community on advisory panels, as somebody in your Rolodex, what do we call Rolodexes? In our content cards. I started out with Rolodexes. I've got an iPhone, so I, I, but I still call them Rolodex. Those contacts that you have, you need to have people that you can call and say, do you know anything about, is there any disability connection here? Should I be paying attention to something beyond the dis accessibility checklist? You need to have committees of disabled people, of diverse disabilities. We're like other diverse communities. We're a lot like Asian Pacific Islanders, where we've just got all kinds of different interests, but we all come under one umbrella. People who are blind, people who are wheelchair users like myself, people who are deaf, different interests, but we all come together under the, the flag of disability. So I would have people that you can connect with to find those connections to make your exhibits better. So today, we have four presenters on stage right, your left, is Kathy Cudlip, who is director of the Longmore Institute on Disability, which is the crown jewel of the uh, centers on disability in the United States, in the world. Um, I am incredibly proud that uh, I get to work with the, uh, the Longhorn Institute. I could go on and on, I shan't. Um, so, uh, Kathy in particular is here because of her work on uh, the major exhibit that Fran was the curator on, Patient No More, which talked about the 1977 sit-in at the Federal Building. Next to her is Joy Elan, who's a writer, and she's going to be talking about perspective of being deaf female museum art performer. Welcome. Thank you. Next is uh, Karen Brent Berniker, who's real, are you still new, Karen, to the uh, Fine Arts Museums, or uh, new-ish, I guess? I am, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so Karen's at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, which is uh, the Diga and Legion of Honor. Uh, She's the access coordinator. And then next to her, last but not least, certainly is 
Cecile Peretz, who is the Access and Community Engagement Manager at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. She'll be talking about the haptic encounters, an element of Jewish folktales retold with work by the blind writer Georgina Klee, which I'm sorry I missed, but sounds like a very cool cultural exhibit. So um, what we're going to do is they're going to do presentations. And then we're going to break up into small groups, and each of them will be taking a group, as will Fran and I, to talk about disability culture and what kind of responses have come up for you. And then the small groups are going to break up into pairs to talk a bit more about it. And then come back, and we're going to gather up what your thoughts are. It's kind of like a Q&A, Kath. Kathy asked, we're going to have a Q&A. It's kind of like a Q&A, and then you get to talk. Um, and we'll be writing down your ideas about how to bring a, culture, a response to disability culture to museums. And then, after closing remarks from Michelle Valdez, there'll be a global museum tour. Is that it, Fran? Are we good? Oh, a film. Oh, I forgot all about the film. Even though I watched it twice, thank you very much. Okay, so. Um, oh, because it was on this page. So now we're going to see the film. And I understand Cecile got to be stuck with the audio-visual. So look at my notes, the one thing I didn't say is that this is a rare panel. Usually I hear from able-bodied people saying this is what disabled people need. And today, on the whole, you get disabled people saying this is what we need. Which is a switch. Cool. I need a classic one. Colin was going on to our left and right, so we're going forward into one of the most popular rooms. Which is the fitting room of his Here at Tate, we hold Britain's collection of British and 20th century art for the nation to enjoy. And so it's our responsibility to ensure that everybody gets the chance to experience it. The Edinburgh Art Centre has a very person centred approach to how people engage with the arts here. For us to be truly accessible, we have to really listen to our local community and other audiences that come to us to make sure what we're doing is for them and it's not about ticking a box, it's actually a meaningful engagement. We've got four tape sites and across all the sites we ensure that access to the building is as complete as possible. But of course, once people are inside the building, we need to think about how our visitors are able to engage with the collection. Intellectual access, if you like. The sculpture we're going to explore this morning is by Frederick Layton, and it's called An Athlete Wrestling with a Python. With our touch to us for individuals or very small groups, it's an opportunity for a visitor to have an in-depth conversation with somebody who works at Tate about a range of artworks which are being described. You can really tell the difference between veins and ciliates because of veins yes. just don't follow the same pattern. I love the way you get the python's body against his arm yeah. like that. It feels like quite a straight nose, what it is. we used to call that an attic profile. Yes. You know, that's quite a great nose, isn't it? Just there in his shoulder. Can you feel that very, very deep dimple? A dimple? I was going to use the word dimple. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. Usually we get things described to us. Someone else looks at them and says, this is what is happening here. This is a man wrestling with a snake. And we can talk about the way the snake's glaring at him, but touching the snake's face at the same time as his face and seeing that happening in my mind directly, that's really special. Tate has an access advisory group who are a board of disabled people who advise us on our processes and practices. 
so that when we're creating a new initiative, we make sure that we are engaging with people with experience of having access needs, so that disabled visitors are included at the very start of the planning stage of any project that we run. We are in Gallery 1 in Attenborough Arts Centre and we have had some great team today who have been having a tactile tour of the exhibition. What can you see? See in. You see you, no, no, it's cool. I mean, at least The sensory suitcases enable people who might not learn in a linear way to engage with themes in the exhibition, whether that be sort of abstract themes or very direct themes around colour, texture, form, light. So we have some film in there so people can touch that and see the progression from a camera to film to a print. We have some frames that people can look through and mirrors. We have torches and magnifying glasses and we're really thinking about how they can engage with the exhibitions in a very tactile and sensory way. <laughs> We try to program crossovers between our creative learning program and our performing arts program and the exhibitions program. And I'm, the learning program that I manage kind of weaves through all of those to try and bring audiences along with us and also to enable them to feedback and inform what we do in the future. There's still far too many sectors of our communities that feel for whatever reason that the arts are not for them, that they're excluded. So one of the reasons why we started to have an Education and Outreach team was to encourage those people to feel that they can access the arts and that there is something really pleasurable about doing so. I mean, in the last seven years, we've grown our audiences from 25,000 to over 109,000. Um, I think that reflects the interest in the work and the repeat visits that we will get from people who understand that we are trying to break down barriers, we're trying to create opportunities for dialogue and discussion. I think that Tate has a very inclusive philosophy towards its public. More and more, access is not owned by visitor experience or learning. Access is being incorporated into so many different projects and activities throughout the gallery. Great. One of the things I realized is that I probably gave short, a little bit short shrift to the Fine Arts Museums and to the Jewish Contemporary Museums. They've been doing wonderful programming around disability, and I think, and, oops. Are we going to get to learn how to make a aluminum foil ball? Uh, I think in the Bay Area, we are incredibly lucky to have the amount of uh, artistic talent we've got represented by Joy and the institutions that we have providing uh, disability access and programming uh, in museums. So. Um, just to reinforce that, I think. I think we're very lucky. Oh, you have a microphone already. I'll go all the way then. What do I then? Sorry. Sorry. Very yeah, sorry. Like. Should I start? Yes, please. Okay, thanks. No, Anthony, you know what it is? It's the feedback that start there. There's an echoing effect. If they get too close to each other, I discover that. Oh, story. I see. Anyway, hi everybody and welcome and thanks for coming on a um, evening, you know, after work and all that. I know that it's kind of a challenge to, you know, do something else, but um, we want to make it worth your while and it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm Kathy Kudlick and I'm, um, as uh, Anthony said, I'm uh, director of the Paul Longmore Institute on Disability here at San Francisco State. And Fran um, and I and um, Emily Babix, our associate director, who some of you might know from other events um, and has been working with you, um, we came up about five years ago with the idea of having um, an exhibit um, called, there's a longer story, but basically we ended up uh, producing an exhibit called Patient No More, People with Disabilities Securing Civil Rights. And it was a play on words, patient uh, being that people with disabilities didn't want to be only seen as in hospital settings and catered to, and patient in that they were impatient to get civil rights. 
And the exhibit um, content was basically about civil rights legislation um, that was passed in 1973 that led to an occupation of San Francisco's federal building in 1977 for about a month by uh, over 100 people with disabilities. They wanted their rights. And it was an amazing story. And we kept circling around and around and coming back to this really exciting San Francisco Bay Area story that brought all sorts of intersections together. And I'm going into the story with some detail, not too much detail, but enough, hopefully, to give you a sense that it was an exhibit that was organized around um, a, a disability history moment, a really iconic moment in um, US history that nobody's talked about, but that was so central for people with disabilities. And we had a very small team of people, and we came up with an exhibit that uh, we had to design to fit a particular space. We had all sorts of interesting constraints that were financial, um, institutional in some ways, uh, story related, um, and also you know wanting to build in access from the very outset. So we had this amazing story that we wanted people to try to get at from a variety of different perspectives. Um, I don't know how many of you were able to see it, um, either at the Ed Roberts campus about five, four, three years ago now. Um, anybody get to see it there? Or at the San Francisco Public Library last summer? No, somebody just make a, make a murmur. Because um, I can't see your hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it was an amazing and interesting set of challenges. You know, we had limited electrical outlets. We had, uh, you know, limited resources in general in terms of how to set it up and how to tell the story. Um, we were in a space where we had to be able to design it in such a way it could be moved in and out easily because the Ed Roberts campus at Berkeley in Berkeley needed to have um, you know, space available for other events, so there was that constraint. And then there, of course, was us wanting to build in access, which was super exciting and really great. And Fran was just an amazing curator. Um, it was really a blast to work with her, plus she was so innovative and smart. Um, and so we came up with, it was a, a classic situation where the limits of the project helped dictate some really exciting possibilities. Um, I think we wouldn't have had as interesting or cool an exhibit if we'd had unlimited budgets and unlimited everything. It was these things, um, a couple of elements that forced design decisions that ultimately made it accessible in really interesting ways. And because we came at it with access from the get-go, that was really exciting. So the, the, two, the two main features that um, I want to highlight today, that there were plenty of others, one of them was something called the Braille Rail. Um, one of the issues with Braille and exhibits is it's always put in places that are like you know nice for the curators or look nice for the exhibit, and blind people can never find the Braille because it's somewhere different, and you know you're moving around trying to find it. And so we designed it so that there was this element where the Braille went all the way through the exhibit, always in the same place in every panel. Um, so that it was a few inches uh, and created this rail um, inside where you could put wiring and other stuff. It turned out to be this really innovative, you know, kind of coup. And it, it determined the, the shape of the exhibit and the design of the stations and the way we told the story ultimately. So that, that was a super great feature. Um, the second thing was a mural that we have. It's still up at the Ed Roberts campus. We mounted it there. You see they have this big, giant rotunda that told, in some ways, the um, story of some of the 504 occupation. And we did it through um, you know, these pictures that Fran curated everywhere, uh, from calling from different sources and things. It was a great story, really wonderful. But then there was the issue, OK, what do you do if somebody can't see the photos? And we wanted to design it in such a way that it wouldn't just be, you know, like, I won, you know, row one, put that so-and-so, row two, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's really boring. Um, we came up with the idea of hiring a poet um, that read the, that came to visit the exhibit or looked at the, looked at the mural and came and responded to it with a sound poem. And we hired a couple of poets to respond in that way. And that added to everyone's experience of the exhibit. It wasn't just, oh, something for those blind people and all of that. Um, I'd like to conclude my um, remarks just with a little, a couple of reflections about that. Really, what you want to be thinking of is this exhibit uh, for people with disabilities is you're not doing something for those people. You're actually trying to do something that will benefit all visitors. 
And I was struck by the movie here, the film clips, that wouldn't it have been cool if you'd had actual, um, all the visitors benefiting from some of those really cool features. I mean, some of the touching, I know that's always a taboo in a museum, um, but why not think about creating an exhibit where everybody could participate in a variety of ways, so it wouldn't just be doing the thing to tick those boxes, and that's where the beyond compliance message comes. You want to be accessing, you know, offering access to people at multiple levels. Um, the second thing I want to say about all that is that you want to think of disabled people as your experts, not just coming in to, and you invite them in for a, a panel or something like that, but think about your staff and your hiring. And, you know, don't just hire accessibility coordinators. Think about maybe a curator that's, that's deaf or a curator um, uh, that's, that's blind or a docent that's blind. I mean, why not? And think about what the implications there would be if you actually had uh, your thinking about staff, not just in terms of providing for those people, but really incorporating that into your hiring structure, into your practices, so there's not just one person that's the um, access person, but actually a built-in person that's invested in your mission and your efforts and, and all that stuff. Um, your donors are, fun, are people with disabilities, they're an aging population, you want to be including them, have them get involved in some of this, um, and have expertise, um, broaden your notion of expertise. Um, to learn more about this, I'm going to give you two, I'm a professor, so I have to give you reading recommendations. <laughs> um, one of them is um, not out yet, but it will be, I um, co-authored an article with Edward Luby here on campus. Um, Ed, are you here? He's teaching a class. He's teaching a class. Oh, he's great. Anyway, we co-authored an article um, that, that uh, looks at uh, disability, this uh, patient no more in this exhibit. It's for a volume called Museums and Activism. And we, we described how we um, came about this, came up with this process. It'll be out, the book will be out at the end of the year. And we'll send out an announcement to everybody when it's out, because I think all museum professionals will want to know about the book anyway. The second reading is by Georgina Klieg, and that we will be hearing more about her in a moment, but um, it's called More Than Meets the Eye. And Klieg is K-L-E-E-G-E. -E -E. And the book is very, very thoughtful and mischievous when it comes to thinking about museum curation and exhibits and the experience of a particularly a blind and low vision visitors. So I'll end there, and um, I'm open for questions, and you know, not right now, but um, you know, in, either in our groups or whatever. I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody and talk more detail about our experience. So thank you. 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 Thank I was born with a hearing loss, and for me, um, written language is very important, which is probably why I became an author. A, because I can hear, not all the people, my message to the world is not all um, that part of people have the same hearing loss. We are, you know, just like vision is different. It's the same thing for hearing. And so for me, it's all about the visual. It's all about the facial expression. It's all about how to read the language. And so I can also hear, so I'm able to speak and interpret what I'm feeling and saying. So for me, as an artist and as an art appreciator, um, I like to challenge myself in different ways. I like to do the visual. I like to try to hear as well. I listen to music to test uh, different ways of um, language, like in, you know, um, double entendres and things like that. I like to challenge that um, perception of language. And as an artist um, and a his history, African American studies major, for me, I use my art as a way to share my stories as well as other people's stories. Because I'm visual, I like to sit and observe people, and then I like to try to describe it in my literature, like what is this person dealing with? What are they, you know, um, because I feel like art 
is a part of history. We are sharing what is happening at that moment in time um, with the world, and especially in literature, like what I love about being an artist, an author, is my book will live on even when I pass away. Like, think about it, we still be catching the vibe, I'm sure. <laughs> All these books, you know. Yeah, I went there. <laughs> But, you know, but for me, you know, I can say, um, in terms of educating people, I like to consider myself kind of like X-Men. Like, we come together, the disability community, we come together to um, empower other people as well as educate other people. You're here because, you know, you want to hear about ways that um, you don't think about. You, you know, like if you saw me walking down the street, would you think I had a disability? And that was something I like to blame people. Like people think I'm wearing the beast by Dre. And like that, come up to me and say, I get headphones. I'm like, what? These are things they But they go, wow, I'm not a thing. But that's the whole point. I'm like, and I'm not offended when people ask me that. And so that's what I like about being an artist is, um, sharing that and making people laugh and just um, making people think as well and just having people um, just look at things from a different perspective. And so like I said, like this video is a perfect example where it has um, captions. And sometimes just like we speak English, but when you go to the UK, they speak English but they have an accent. They may be a little harder for me to understand exactly what they're saying. And also another thing is sound language isn't the same. Just like Bay Area lingo is different from maybe New York lingo. Sound language is different based on areas. And if I were to do American sign language in Europe, oh man, I wouldn't understand it because that's like, think about it, that's like speaking German. So English and German are not the same. So like I said, it's, um, it's a whole big um, complex, it's very complex. And um, I, like I said, my job is to bring awareness, like it's not all the same. We're not all the same. We don't all learn the same either. And you know, for me, it's important that we come together and you know, kind of break down these barriers in ourselves. Just open your mind and get you to think about different things. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Karen Greninger. I'm the Access Coordinator of the Fine Arts Museum here at Fischerska. And I'm here today to talk about our uh, access programming. Um, I also uh, self-identify myself as having a hearing loss as well as a vision loss. And so I think I really bring a very unique perspective to being the Access Coordinator. Um, the Fine Arts Museum for San Francisco is um, a city <coughs> institution, and um, as Anthony mentioned earlier, it is the Young Museum, which is in Golden Gate Park, as well as the Legion of Honor, which is in Lincoln Park. Access Days actually started 30 years ago, and the whole idea was to open up the museum on Monday when it's closed to the general public. And this way, it really allows individuals with disabilities to come on a day when you don't have crowds to contend with, you don't have loud noises to deal with. And so um, we typically have 10 docent led tours uh, starting at 10 into about 3. So while we have those 10 tours, two of them happen concurrently. And um, they usually start 15 minutes right after the other. So again, noise, space is not an issue. Um, we have two low vision tours that are scheduled, typically at noon and one. And so we do registration ahead of time. We have this mass email that goes out to the registration list. And um, the only way you can gain admittance to an access day is if you pre-register. We just need to know how many people we plan on having on a day when the museum is closed. Um, so as far as the tours, what's great about these tours is that 
they're led by access docents who have been specially trained on how to provide a highly descriptive tour. Um, so they really think in terms of um, starting with the macro and ripping their way into the micro description of whatever the piece of art may be. They may also have tactile objects to share with the group. Um, and we also have the large print labels for our booklets uh, for the Casanova tour. This is available not just on access day, but on any day for the special exhibition. Um, one thing I do want to mention about special exhibition, just in case you don't know, is that at the Fine Arts Museum, they typically run for about four months. Um, so they're considered temporary exhibitions. So for that reason, that's the reason why we have the large print table for the special ex exhibition. We don't yet have them for the permanent collection. That's on my very long list of things to do. But getting back to access days, we also have um, ASL tours. Again, this is usually by request. We usually need to have two weeks notice so that we can arrange for interpreters. Uh, for any visitors who are hard of hearing, we have um, assistive listening devices um, that work for some, but not for all. And we always try to make it a point to have either the interpreter or the docent to stand on a stool so that there's a better line of sight for anybody that needs to read lips or um, to watch somebody sign in. The um, other kind of accommodation we make is we usually uh, have 20 wheelchairs lined up um, from the beginning of the day. So anyone walking in, if they choose to use the wheelchair, it's there. If they need somebody to push the wheelchair, we have volunteers and staff um, who can do that for them. Um, we also have a fragrance-free policy in our access day. So we remove all of our flowers the day before, and we make sure we send a reminder to our staff and security guards not to wear fragrances. Um, I think, in a nutshell, that pretty much what wraps up what Access Day is all about. I um, have a flyer here for our next Access Day, if somebody can pass that around. Um, it's at the De Young for the Court of the Machine exhibition. Please feel free to, you know, sign up or pass it on to somebody who you think may benefit from it. Thank you. Um, the best way to get in touch with me is at access at famsf.org. I have my business card. I'm happy to pass that around. Um, the next exhibition that will be taking place at the Legion of Honor uh, will be Truth and Beauty. The pre Raphaelite and Blue Master, and that will be in July. So, in addition to the flyer for the next access day, I also have a schedule of access days that are scheduled for the next 12 months. And what we do is we alternate between the two museums to keep it interesting. So, um, it's not just the same museum or the other. Thank you. Um, I work at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. I've been there since 2008, um, where I launched access programs probably around 2010. Um, I originally was hired to manage all of our guided tours and volunteer programs, and um, quickly noticed um, as not only a culturally specific museum, but also as a museum in general, um, who was not coming in through the door. And so that was a question that I started asking and planting the seed for and connecting with folks in the community and asking those questions. Um, and so over the years, sort of that trajectory shifted. 
Um, and I think that this conversation today, really thinking about how do you take it past the nuts and bolts, to really talking to the people, um, showing up at community meetings, and also thinking about what are the intersections with disability justice, um, I think have changed me and changed the museum. Um, I also just want to acknowledge and name the fact that the Longmore Institute on Disability, Catherine Kudlick, um, were really a big part of that shift by bringing the International Disability Film Festival to the CJM was an important part in how we took that conversation to a whole different um, level because we were creating, thinking about creating a platform for disabled artists, disabled filmmakers, actors, um, activists as well, and, and creating a space for that in the museum. So from that has shifted me, but also has opened up um, a space, but also interesting tension within the museum and what that might look like. So um, I'm going to be talking today about um, a program that I collaborated with a professor from UC Berkeley. Her name is Georgina Klee, um, who was mentioned earlier for her book. Um, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the name right now. More Than Meets uh, the Eye, uh, What Blindness Brings to Art. And so really thinking about how do we flip that paradigm that people with disabilities are not just visitors, um, or audience members, but they're also, and this is another idea that, um, that's come to me from Catherine, is this idea of people with disabilities being creators and producers, and that they have something to add to the cultural knowledge of our society, of our museums. Um, and so I, uh, when I first met Georgina, the work that she was doing and her scholarship really focuses on how do we push the norms of what audio description is and might look like in a museum. Um, and I think we heard from the, the introductory video, the man had said, um, the individual had said, um, this is usually described to me by a sighted person. And so that was this idea of how do we shift that? And how do we actually put a, an artist, a scholar, someone who has a lived experience of blindness, who's interested in those intersections between art and blindness, um, to lead that conversation. So, um, um, on the slide is Georgina Klee. She is standing in front of um, she's standing in front of the introductory wall outside the gallery. And it reads "Jewish folk tales retold," and I just wanted to read this quote. Um, this is uh, she says: "There needs to be the expectation that blind people have something to contribute to cultural knowledge beyond gratitude for this gift of inclusion." Right? So we're not just like the benevolent museum. Um, thank you for this gift of inclusion. No. Um, the more, um, and handing over the reins um, of leadership in that way, and, and what does that open up for the museum, right? What also does opening up the idea of having a blind docent or a blind tour guide, um, and what new knowledge um, can they introduce to the museum? Um, it also introduced ideas of debunk debunking myths around blindness that Georgina, in a moment you'll, we'll talk about her um, in her video, We'll talk about this idea that um, a lot of times blind people are inscribed with this idea that they have this hypersensory sense of touch. Um, and she says, no, really, it's about having parents who were artists, and that I grew up handling art objects in their studios, and that I have a real interest in this. Um, so that's an important myth um, that she debunked for us as a museum. And so this took the conversation of access out of education and visitor experience into the realm of curatorial. And so what new aesthetic kind of understanding open, did that open up in terms of um, talking about art, looking about art, looking at art? Um, and I'll just quickly also add that this, um, as Anthony mentioned, was a show about folk tales, and she's a storyteller. So it really fit really nicely to have Georgina add, as, add her voice um, and observations as a storyteller. So what are haptic encounters? So haptic, I'm going to play the video, so actually I'll, I'll stop talking and let Georgina speak for herself. Um, and while I'm getting it started, um, has anyone heard of that word haptic before? Or has, yeah? yeah. What, what does that mean to you? Or what is that? I don't know who said yes. Video games. Yeah, so we're hearing about it a lot in technology. Um, but it has older origins. Um, so let me let Georgina tell you about it. 
So there's an introductory slide that just says Jewish folk tales retold, haptic encounters with Georgina Klee. I'm Georgina Klee, and I'm happy to be here at the Contemporary Jewish Museum to give you a haptic encounters tour of the Jewish folk tales retold exhibit. What haptic means is basically pertaining to touch. So all aspects of touch, uh, both texture, temperature, density, but also aspects of touch that have to do with moving around a piece of art. I came to this work because I am the blind daughter of two visual artists. So I grew up in artist studios and art galleries and spent a lot of my childhood uh, handling works of art and art materials. As an adult, I've also taken advantage of touch tours at museums around the world. So I have a lot of experience touching art and have developed specific techniques to do so. And I think museums are often understood to be visual spaces, but I think there's something to be gained by considering the other senses and how those can inform our understanding of a work of art. I've learned that different works of art seem to invite or incite or provoke different kinds of touching. So some works require very delicate handling with the fingertips, while other pieces seem happy to be handled and manipulated with the whole hand. And there are even pieces uh, that can inspire a kind of muscular handling with the hands and the arms and the whole body. The other qualification that I bring to this work is that I am an English, English professor. I'm a writer. I teach at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so I know a lot about how stories work, and I've been interested in how these visual artists have translated the stories they've chosen into visual media. And so as I move from piece to piece, I'm also talking about what it is that I'm feeling, but I'm also kind of engaging with and reinterpreting uh, the artist's reading of the stories that they give to us in their pieces. These haptic encounters are available at listening stations around the gallery. You can put on the earphones and listen to them. Uh, and I hope you enjoy encountering the work this way. Great, so I'll talk for a few more minutes. Is that okay? Okay, can I run through a few photos? So let me actually show you what that had. So there was a tactile map that I have here that you can take a look at. This is an image of Georgina in front of one of the pieces with some music in the background. Oh, it's not the next video. Let's just run through them. So these were all handling objects on the table that the artist um, lent to us. Um, that we're hopefully going to create an archive out of. This is one large um, piece. These are all available in the digital catalog, so you can watch the tour, listen to it. This is in front of this large um, animal-like sculpture that's over eight feet tall called Golem, which is a Jewish folklore um, mythical creature. Here's her touching a tree. Um, and then um, this was one of her favorites, is lunging her body inside of these nine panels made out of recycled rags and paper. So the artist gave her access to their pieces in the gallery. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. A wonderful, uh, diverse presentation 
some ways of thinking about disability access and culture. So I hope this this sparks some ideas for for you. What the idea was now was to break up into small groups and be able to get a chance for you to start talking about some of the ideas, some of your responses about this, and then be able to come back as a group and to kind of gather some of those. So what I'd like to suggest is that the four people here each lead a group along with Fran and me. So I would say Karen's going to be here at the front because she's using um, CART, which is captioning in real time. There's our captioner over there. Um, so Kathy, can we put you in that corner there? Yes. Joy, maybe over here? Yes. And what you're going to have to do is drag your chairs around into these small groups, and then I think we'll probably just 